I have a question about uh, first about Sitaram Goel and uh, mm. Ram Sarup Ji. So, uh, my, if my understanding is right, uh, Goel Ji always put the saint at a higher pedestal than the theologian. So he did what? He put the saint at a higher pedestal than a theologian. Yes, of course. Yeah, and so in in that sense, I would like to know what his opinion of uh, uh, Adi Shankaracharya was. Because uh, there is not much writing on no. Adi Shankaracharya or any of the Hindu saints per se. And uh, regarding uh, uh, Ram Sarupji, I would like he had uh, taken a yogic view of other religions. Yes. So I want to know how much in Hindu, how much of a precedent it has in Hindu history in terms of analyzing different ideologies or different darshanas. Yes. Um about uh, Shankara, I can't remember offhand if he wrote anything about it. I do know that he said privately that he, he didn't think too much of Shankara. He thought he was quite pedestrian. And um, you see, he was not a great thinker. He was a theologian. In fact, he quoted scripture all the time. Like, you see, proper yoga would be you know, by the yogic experience, you achieve knowledge. Whereas he would turn this around, he would say, well, the yogic knowledge is, is laid down in a number of Vedic verses, the Mahavakyas. And so the goal of yoga is to realize these Mahavakyas. No, it's the other way around. It's to realize a certain consciousness, and that consciousness is what then later has been laid down in the formula of these Mahavakyas, like Tatvam Asi or like Aham Brahma Asmi, I am the Absolute, uh, you know, to, to, to realize the, 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 the sameness of the individual consciousness and the Absolute, the Brahma. Um, so, uh, you could say that he was quite a theologian who went by scripture Whereas scripture itself, and this is far clearer in Hinduism than in Christianity or Islam, is itself only an outflow of a certain state of consciousness. See, which it is not in Christianity or Islam. There you have the notion of revelation. Something is, you know, thrown down from heaven. You know, the Quran has been with Allah since creation, that's the doc Islamic doctrine, and then it has been revealed to Muhammad and ever since it exists on earth. Um, so that is not the case in Hinduism. In, in Hinduism you have the achievement of a certain state of consciousness, and then all the scriptures follow from that. You see, in that sense, here I'm uh, harking back to a conversation I remember with Ram Swarup, the line um, Sarva Dharma Samabhava, all religions you see are the same essentially, that uh, is in a sense true for all the Dharmic Sampradayas. You see, there is a certain, uh, you know, what, you, what outsiders call a zero experience, you see, a state of absolute consciousness that is achieved by practice by meditation, though, of course, in some, if you accept reincarnation, some people have done most of the practice in a past life, and so they seem to achieve it easily in this life, to just get it. But that too is the result of a long uh, work. Anyway, so at one point, you achieve this state of consciousness. Now, then, you see, when people come down from this state of consciousness, they start reasoning about it, and they create some framework around it of concepts. Like they say, you know, this, this consciousness is uh, the conquering of avidya, of ignorance, which is to confuse the objects of consciousness with consciousness itself. And so there's a whole complicated uh, philosophy around this. Or you can say with the Buddha that, you see, all these incarnations are suffering, and that this state of consciousness brings you beyond suffering and, and, you see, finishes off suffering. So you have a number of different philosophies that grow around this absolute state of consciousness. 
and that's what creates different sampradayas within the Hindu landscape. However, the basic state of consciousness is the same. Whereas with Christianity and Islam, you do not have this. So you can say Sarva Dharma um, uh, Samabhava in the sense that the dharmas, the dharmic traditions, they indeed have a common core. They have a lot of differences outside, but at heart they are the same. But you see, Islam is not a dharma. And so in Islam you don't have this. I mean, at some point you see human nature being what it is. Some people still start exploring mystically, you know, states of consciousness. And so you do get a certain mysticism within Islam, which tries to cast itself into, you know, Islamic terminology, but which is not Islamic. You see, the Sufis who strive for what they call fana, which means nothingness, you see, that's just a synonym for nirvana. And so that, and you know, in Central Asia there was plenty of Buddhism, then it became Islamic, but many of these ideas remained in the air, and so some people picked them up, you know, worked them out, and so you have a number of people with Muslim names who did non-Muslim practices. But you see, Islam itself is of a totally different nature, it doesn't have this state of con, it doesn't care for that. Or like, uh, in, in, in the book that made me discover uh, these two people, namely Goel's book, uh, History of Hindu-Christian Encounters, there is a description of an interaction between Ram Swarup and the Jesuits, where he tries to explain, you see, you have to, you know, meditation and you reach, you know, a state of consciousness. And you see to these Christians, who are very learned people, you know, have studied both theology and then another, so they have at least two university diplomas. They're reputed very intelligent, very learned, but that didn't mean anything to them. They just couldn't understand, you see, what is this, you know, this is some funny feeling. No, no, we have salvation, we have Jesus, you know, we have blood because he died. You know, whereas you people, you know, you are like up in the air, and, uh, well, you see that up in the air, that is the real thing. And yes, you see, and so that's for, typical for Hinduism and for all the different forms of Jainism and so on. They are all Hinduism in, in the broad sense. And, and Christianity and Islam are not. All right. Uh, there was a second question you asked. Uh, what precedent does Ram Sarup's analysis have in the tradition? Our ah, yeah, well, yeah, the short answer is that, of course, in tradition, there was plenty of criticism. You see, there was a serious rational thinking. Um, in fact, at present, I'm rereading the book by this communist, uh, Chattopadhyay or something, uh, Hindu atheism. And so that's about atheism in Sankhya, atheism in Nyaya, and so on. And so uh, that, that was very much there. And these schools were debating among each other. And they were debating with the theistic schools. And so, you, you know, you get this survey work, uh, this Sarva Darshana Sangraha by Madhava Charya, I think 1300 thereabouts, which includes everything. Buddhism is there, um, you know, Shaivism and so on or the six darshanas, uh, they're all together, like 16 different schools. And so that's real Hinduism, you see, they all have a place. And they have, they had a culture of, of exploring their differences and asserting one viewpoint or another viewpoint, and they had certain rules for debate. And so when new sampradayas came in, namely Christianity and Islam, you continue that process of debate. Now here, it is an interesting historical question, why Hindus didn't do more of it? Now, there is also an answer to that, namely because the, the violent nature of their acquaintance with Islam or with Portuguese Christianity was such that, you know, there was little occasion for, for dialogue. 
And so that, that has greatly delayed the natural process of continuing the debate to which Hindus were accustomed. But so it's entirely in the Hindu tradition. And nowadays when Hindus say, yeah, you know, we should ban this and so on. Well, like when, when, when the Donegar's book was published, which is a, you know, a very bad book full of errors. Uh, nevertheless, you see, Hindus were perhaps correctly uh, indignant about it, but they, they drew the wrong conclusion and we must ban this book. Now, first of all, in this day and age, this is totally unrealistic because you put it online and it is still available to everyone. Uh, but it is also wrong in principle. You see, the British, they imposed this law 295A because they had this colonial view of you people are not capable of debating, which is historically very incorrect. Um, but so that was in fact to shield Islam from criticism. That's what the book was about. I mean, what the law was about, you know, it was a reaction to the murder of Shraddhananda who had criticized Islam. So Muslims didn't want that to the extent that they killed people who did it. And so, um, so that's not Hindu to imitate that. You see, the law was formulated by the British in such a way that it would protect every religion. Though, you see, at first, Hindus and also Christians didn't make use of it. It's only much later that they discovered, well, actually, we can use that too. But so it was meant to shield Islam from criticism. Now, yeah, you see, let Islam do that, you know, uh, get, get dangerous when they get criticized. But in Hinduism, the process of criticism is perfectly normal. Hello, sir. Uh, my question is about uh, Sri Sitaram Goelji. In his book, uh, How I Became a Hindu, mm. he writes that he saw the uh, Ayodhya Ram Mandir movement as an opportunity to educate the masses about Islam yes. in general. Uh, through its scriptures and people should read its scriptures. Mm -hmm. How did he plan to do that in uh, such a hostile environment? And did he eventually do that? Did he translate some of the scriptures as they were in English or uh, any Indic language? Well, he did what he could, yes. And um, so he, he did um, uh, bring together a number of uh, statements from the Quran and uh, in another book statements from the Bible. And so he, he argued about how these, this doctrine led to a certain behavior pattern that had always spelled doom for Hindus. Um, so he certainly contributed. It's only a question, did it, did it have any effect? Like there is a very, very, very good text of Goel about um, the real nature of Islamic revelation, uh, which is the introduction to the final edition of the Calcutta Quran petition. And so wherein he shows that, well, Muhammad was a mentally troubled individual who heard voices. Now, normally when you hear voices, you think there's a problem. And in fact, the first person who thought so was Muhammad. So I'm not inventing anything. Goalji was not inventing anything, you see. We take Muhammad serious. And so, yeah, you see, when Muhammad heard this voice for the first time and saw this Archangel Gabriel, he thought, I'm going crazy. I'm, you know, this is ghost possession. And, you know, I don't want to be the village idiot of Mecca, so I'm going to commit suicide. And then he didn't. And then, and then the rest is history. <laughs> uh, uh, but so Goalji did that. It's only that, you know, he didn't have a channel to do that. I mean, yeah, he, he published a book which a few hundred people read. But then, um, you see, the, the Hindu movement didn't take that up. In fact, they avoided it like the plague. They wanted to look secular. They wanted to get this restoration of a Hindu temple without tabling the reason why this problem existed in the first place. 
And so, no, you say, so the BJP avoided it. Uh, like, for instance, a case in which, uh, well, um, I am also, I also had a role to play. Um, I, I met Goelji in, I think, November or early December 89. And um, so this was when the Ayodhya moment was in full swing. So I thought, you know, after I had heard his uh, comments on it, and then I understood a lot more of why all this was happening. I, I, I thought, you see, I'm going to write a little book about this. And I did. And, you know, there was nothing important about that book, you know. This, uh, I don't think it was a good book, but anyway, you know, it was just a journalistic work bringing information together. And then coming to the conclusion, you see, if we look at what historians have done, what archaeologists have found, then it's obvious that there was a temple there. And that was nothing special to say, in fact. You see, normal in the normal world, that would have been no news. Because that was the consensus. You see, the Hindus, the Muslims, the British, they all thought that that Bavri Masjid was built in forcible replacement of a temple. It's only in 1989, that same year, that the eminent historians from JNU issued this statement, The Political Abuse of History, where suddenly they said, no, there was no temple there, uh, where they created a lot of panic, you know, about this is, this is the Mecca of secularism, this is the last bastion against these ugly, vicious hordes of Hindus. And so, uh, so we, we absolutely have to save it. Now, the effect on politics was that the Congress party, which was thinking about leaving the place to the Hindus and thinking of some, not really a very principled solution, but a practical solution, you know, they thought, let this place be for the Hindus, and then we will buy off the Muslims with some, some concessions, some goodies, you know. I mean, like, Congress politicians can be counted on to do, you know, horse trading. And so then this would be just, just another temple, you know, n nothing special. But it is the eminent historians, nobody else, who created the Ayodhya affair. And so after that, it became very difficult for politicians to even handle it. Uh, so then you had all these riots and you had a government falling over it. You had state governments dismissed. You had a new form of terrorism, 12 March 1993 in Mumbai. Um, so it's a very influential affair. And you see, it need not have been anything special. Now within that affair, uh, my little contribution was that I simply restated, well, you see, the emperor has no clothes. You know, the eminent historians are saying something that if you look at the facts, it's just not true. And so the old consensus was right after all. Um, so, but you see, that was special because in India, the the eminent historians were creating the impression, yeah, you see, the West, the, the rational, the advanced West that doesn't have this, this communal problem and so on. They think, you know, that there was never a temple there, that this is superstition. Um, so, and it is true that most Westerners simply followed suit. You see, they heard from their Indian colleagues, oh yeah, you see, the bad guys are saying that there was a temple there. You see, they concocted that story. In reality, there was never a temple there. So all the Western professors followed suit. And then suddenly, you see, there was this one little guy from the West, namely me, who said the opposite. And so, so you see, that came in handy for the BJP that by then had appropriated the issue. Now, therefore, uh, L.K. Adwani um, gave a press conference where he presented my book. He held it up in the air. That photograph was on the cover of very many Indian newspapers. But it was not just my book. You see, another book that he never would have brought to attention. You see, that, you see, he was sort of forced by circumstances to give that equal uh, attention. Namely, Sitaram's Goel's book, Hindu Temples, What Happened to Them. So, on that occasion, that was one occasion where the BJP played along. But then after that, again, you see, they have not, not seen that in this light. 
In the VHP, yes, there have been some sadhus and so on, some more traditional people who have said, you know, we don't want just Ayodhya, we want three temples. Then some cynics among those sadhus have even said, you see, once we get Ayodhya, then we will add another third so that we always have three masjids that we want to liberate, you see. So when Ayodhya is, is liberated, then we will add the Jama Masjid in Delhi, and then we will ask, you know, something else, Ajmer, Ajmer Darga, and so on. So we will always have three mosques on our agenda that we want to turn into temples again. Uh, but so that's very marginal. You know, there's a few people who, who said and did that, but um, no, on the whole, you see, the Hindu movement has tried to keep this in low key as much as possible. What is the vision and foresight of the two Mahatmas about the global unification of uh, Pagans and heathens worldwide? And along with that, I would like to know your view about the uh, op opening of uh, intellectual front against Abrahamism by the native uh, citizens, the native uh, uh, citizens who are following the indigenous cultures and civilizations yes. worldwide. Right. So there is a movement, and. Um, this was started by an American RSS Pracharak, who is also a professor of uh, biochemistry or something like that. Pharmacy, I think. Um, namely, Yashwant Pathak. Uh, the triannual conference of the elders of all religions. The gathering of the elders, that's what it's called. It takes place every three years started in i think 2003 so it took place in mumbai again last year it's always in an indian city and so all the foreign delegates also express their preference for india but so it brings together the maoris and the mayas and and the, the lithuanian pagans and so on so they all come together there I think that the uh, movement misses a bit of profundity. You see, it's, uh, it still has too much the atmosphere of a, a jamboree, you know, of a feel-good thing with a lot of, uh, well, easy and fashionable themes like Mother Earth, like, you know, care for the environment. These things are important, of course. Uh, but they too avoid the really hard stuff. But that's okay, you see, because if you're going to deal with the hard points of conflict, you have to know how far you can go, what you can say, what is psychologically for the masses most useful to say, uh, what, by contrast, only creates unnecessary conflict, what gives a bad impression, you know, that reflects on yourself and so on. It's a very, very hot potato. And so, you see, there are some people like myself who just love to do that. But most people don't, and that's okay. Um, so, so, they don't do that, but nevertheless, in a way, they do do that, because they bring there, you know, for the first time, for instance, that I saw them myself, the Yazidis, with their story of enslavement by uh, the Islamic State. Then, um, you see, within that group, I am now um, trying to get the, for their, their next get-together in 2021, the um, Wataniya, people, that is to say the Arab neo-pagans. There are a number of Arabs, started in Lebanon, which is not a very Islamic country, but now it's also active in Saudi Arabia and everywhere, for Arab paganism, for the Arab religion from before Muhammad. And so, you know, you don't have to talk about Islam, this and Christianity, that. Forget about them. But, you know, simply by existing, by showing that somehow you have survived Islam and Christianity, or you have come back, uh, you are already making a statement. And indeed, you see the uh, Christian missionaries, they have seen it, you know. 
I mean, it's never talked about in the newspapers or so. It gets little attention in Hindu society. And the missionaries also don't want to draw attention to it. But they themselves are very aware of it. And so that movement very much recognizes the influence of Ram Swarup. And so that, that was one of the subjects dear to Ram Swarup's heart. It was the rediscovery of pre-Christian and pre-Islamic religion and of the commonness between their pantheon and, and that of Hinduism. Yeah, Conrad. Yes. So, I recall uh, uh, you writing in one of your books, I think it's negationism, uh, historical negationism. So, there you write uh, a very interesting note that, uh, you know, I foresee uh, that the end of Islam uh, will come with a bang just like it started. Mm -hmm. Do you still hold that view or have you revised it? Well, this is something we've discussed frequently, you see, what is going to happen. And um, I think at that time it was not so clear yet, but today I think that those ideas that sometimes both of them mused about, but with, you know, it was all in the future, that now, you see, it is becoming a realistic proposal that Christianity in a bit longer term, but Islam in a quite spectacular manner, will indeed hasten to their end. Now, here I am, I am wary, you see, I don't like to say this, because the reaction of Hindus will be, ah, in that case we don't have to do anything, yeah. <laughs> So, I do think you will have to do something. It will not go automatically. Yeah. Nevertheless, um, it, there is now in Islam quite a movement of uh, criticizing Islam or of leaving Islam. You see, that, that phenomenon of still naming yourself a Muslim, but still also distancing your, yourself from like everything that is Islamic. You can see that in Imam Tawhidi. You know him? You know, he's, uh, there's a lot of YouTube films and he's active on Twitter and so on. So he was also there in that Artha festival. You know, that, that brought together, you see, everybody. Um, so like Raji Malhotra was there, Vadlamani was there, uh, Shef Ali Vaidya was there. Um, and so this Imam Tawhidi, I had never met, or Tarek Fatah, another like ex-Muslim, he also avoids calling himself an ex-Muslim. You see, he says he's an enlightened Muslim, but in effect, you see, he's against everything that Muslims are for. And he totally stands with the Hindus. And he praises Narendra Modi and everything. Now, similarly, this, uh, so this ta ta Tawhidi, the same story. So those Muslims also exist. Uh, but what what is an even more interesting phenomenon is that many Muslims are leaving Islam. And this is quite new. Um, I discovered this whole thing uh, with the Rusdi affair. You see, I was studying in Varanasi when, you see, I read the newspaper every day and I saw in the communist fortnightly frontline a big debate between the communists and the congress-side secularists about the correctness of banning this book. And so this, this is the Satanic Verses was banned by Rajiv Gandhi. And many, uh, co you know, Congress side secularists like, like uh, Kushwan Singh or like MJ Akbar approved of the ban. Whereas the communists back then, later they changed their line, but back then they were as critical of Islam as of Hinduism. And so they were in favor of the ban. Now, uh, in, they were against the ban and in favor of, of the, the questions that the book raised. Um, now, in those days, Rushdie was supported by all the leftist intellectuals, which would not have been be the case today. Now, most of the left in the West also has turned pro-Islamic. Uh, but by contrast, 
Back then he had no support from the Muslim world, whereas now, at least in the West, you see, every country has a society of ex-Muslims. And so you have people like, uh, like Ibn Warhaq who writes very competent works against Islam, analyzing everything that is wrong with Islam. It's the kind of work that Sitaram Gowal did. Um, but so they've taken it up in right earnest. And so now, and they quote Goel also quite often, they, they recognize his influence. But so they've taken it further. Um, they, they give all the, all the negative facts about Islamic theology as well as Islamic history. Um, so there is this tendency going on of Muslims leaving the faith. Uh, the Pew Research Center has found in North Africa through their opinion polls, uh, which are very professional, that about 30% of the youth doesn't believe in Islam anymore. Now, of course, young people are less religious. Often they return to their roots later in life. So this 30% need not be taken literally. But it all depends, you see. The 30% can also become 50 and 70 and 90%. That's what's been happening in Europe. You know, in my country in the 1950s was very solidly Catholic. And it's around 1970 that the downturn began. And then you see more and more people started saying, but hey, what am I doing here? You see, there are certain values that you associate with religion. Okay, but you can have those values without these funny beliefs that define Christianity. And so many more people left. Then also all the conformistic people who went to church because everybody went, suddenly started turning around. They started staying away from church because everybody started staying away. And so I foresee that this is going to happen in Islam too. And sooner than at the time Ram Sarup and Sitaram Gohal even thought possible. You see this has much to do, I think, with the new style of communication, with the internet, with the social media, so that now, you see, these thought processes go much faster. And you see, new insights are communicated very fast. This works in a negative sense. For example, some communist in front line thought up, like 10 years ago, that Vir Savarkar had written a favorable letter to the British, trying to curry favor with them in order to be released from prison. Now, immediately, see, now every leftist writing about Hindu nationalism will say that uh, Savarkar was a collaborator with the British. And we, the left, we were for independence, we were anti-colonial, whereas the whole Hindu movement is corrupt, you see, is collaborating with colonialism. Uh, so, you know, that has caught on very fast. Uh, so, Lies can also spread much faster than they used to, true, but the truth can also spread much faster. And so I see that happening. Uh, many more uh, inquisitive Muslims are starting to wonder what, why they are Muslim at all. So, so the critique of Islam that those gentlemen formulated, at that time it was purely theoretical. You know, they didn't expect really it to have an effect. Indeed, they said so. You see, we do not aim to, to convert the Muslims or anything. We aim at informing the Hindus. Because it's the Hindus who are, well, misinformed. And indeed, you see, the Hindus have such a mentality that if you start criticizing Islam, long before you run into trouble with the Muslims, it is the Hindus who turn against you. <clears throat> Why does the BJP never say anything against Islam? Because then the Hindus won't vote for them. The Muslims are never going to vote for them anyway. So that's not the point. The point is that Hindus don't like this, that you criticize anyone. So, you know, they didn't mean it for Muslim, but now it, it reaches the Muslim audience more and more. And so it has a surprisingly fast effect. So maybe some of us will live to see the day when Islam is leaving the scene. <laughs>